Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? If we could take seats, please, so that we can get started. Wow, that was remarkably quick and effective. Thank you. So, without further ado, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, welcome to the United Nations and to the 11th annual observance of World Autism Awareness Day. My name is Alison Smale and I am the UN's Under Secretary General for Global Communications. At the outset, I would like to no acknowledge and thank the permanent missions of Argentina, Bangladesh, Bulgaria, Israel, Italy, Japan, Kazakhstan, and Poland for their generous contribution. We greatly value such support for the cause that brings us together today. Awareness of autism has undeniably grown over the past decade. It is equally true that we still have a long way to go when it comes to ensuring that persons with autism enjoy the rights and freedoms to which we are all entitled. That is one reason we have come together today. We must recommit to prom promoting acceptance of persons with autism and to raising awareness of their rights to equal opportunity and full participation in society. The theme of this year's observance is assistive technologies, active participation. It underlines the importance of such technologies for people on the autism spectrum in reducing and even eliminating barriers they face and in improving their lives. These technologies are much more than tools that are useful or nice to have. Reliable access to affordable assistive technologies is a fundamental human rights issue. Yet in many parts of the world, such access is sorely lacking, depriving people with autism of opportunities that many of us take for granted. To achieve a truly inclusive society, we must ensure the fundamental rights enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities are known and respected. To this end, I hope today's event serves as an inspiration to all of us to redouble our efforts to ensure no one is left behind. The Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, is traveling in North Africa and regrets not being able to join us in person today. He sends his best wishes for the day. It is now my honor to read the Secretary General's message to you all. Quote, on World Autism Awareness Day, we speak out against discrimination, celebrate the diversity of our global community, and strengthen our commitment to the full inclusion and participation of people with autism. David is happy. <laughs> Supporting them to achieve their full potential is a vital part of our efforts to uphold the core promise of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is to leave no one behind. This year's observance underscores the importance of affordable assistive technologies to support people with autism to live independent lives and indeed to exercise their very basic human rights. Around the world, there are still major barriers to accessing such technologies, including high costs, unavailability, and a lack of awareness of their potential. Last year, I launched a strategy on new technologies to ensure that new and emerging technologies are aligned with the values enshrined in the UN Charter, international law, and human rights conventions, including the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. On World Autism Awareness Day, 
let us reaffirm our commitment to these values, which include equality, equity, and inclusion, and to promoting the full participation of all people with autism by ensuring that they have the necessary tools to exercise their rights and fundamental freedoms." Unquote. That concludes the Secretary General's message. It is now my honor to introduce our keynote <laughs> speaker this morning, David James Savarisi. Mr. Savarisi is a 2017 to 2019 Open Society Foundation's Human Rights Initiative Youth Fellow. He works to make literacy-based education, communication, and inclusive lives a reality for all non-speaking people through artful advocacy, community-based projects, teaching, and public speaking. He is also the co-producer of the Peabody Award-winning and Emmy-nominated documentary, Dej, Inclusion Shouldn't Be a, a Lottery. Told from the inside out, the film calls on viewers to disrupt their own and others' misperceptions of non-speaking people, to celebrate what's possible, and to challenge their understanding of what communication and connection uh. truly entail. Mr. Savarisi graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Oberlin College in 2017 with a double major in anthropology and creative writing. Mr. Savarisi is the author of a book, A Doorknob for the Eye, as well as poems, prose, and essays that have appeared in a wide range of literary journals. He is also one of the only two alternatively communicating autistics in the United States to be fully included from kindergarten through college graduation. And now, it is my pleasure to give the floor to you, Mr. Savarisi. Please. Hi, everyone. My name is David James Savarese, and I'm honored to be here today as an OSF Human Rights Initiative yeah. Youth Fellow, an artful activist and one of many alternatively communicating autistics to talk to you about assistive technology and active participation. If asked, we would all agree that communication and freedom are basic human rights, but how we define these concepts can greatly affect who does and does not have access to them. Each of us has the capacity to make the world a better place. Knowing and believing that is called self-efficacy. People say too much time is spent listening to fear. They're right. Making yourself mad or afraid about something isn't what makes for change. Hope, not fear, is what drives our self-efficacy. I leave viewers at the end of my documentary film with the reminder that hope lives on, messy, imperfect. I say this because hope takes work. Nurture it by meaningfully engaging with others about what matters. Each success fosters our belief in ourselves. If I'm hopeful, I'm open to other ideas. I'm making a difference in others' lives, not just my own. It's my hope that all people will get the support they need to be able to actively participate, not just as individuals, but as a part of something greater than themselves. I'm often asked how I've managed to thrive and to remain hopeful in a world in which many non-speaking people are segregated all of their lives. People might say I'm thriving because of all I've accomplished, but I would say I'm thriving because I'm growing and connecting in a lot of different directions simultaneously. And I have been for the past 20 years. I would say I'm thriving because I live life rhythmatically. It's interdependence we're striving for here. The right to a rhythmatic way of life in the cultivated garden of a self-reliant, speech-based society. But why rhizomes, you ask? Well, unlike so-called true roots, which have single roots and stems, rhizomes persevere, 
by creating an intricate network of multiple root bulbs full of nutrients and resources that grow both vertically and laterally. If cut down, they grow back. Faced with adverse conditions, they can lie dormant underground for up to a year, rejuvenating themselves, before blossoming again. In this sense, weeding them out is far more difficult, if not impossible. With no center or defined boundaries, a rhizome is limited only by its environment, by where it lives. My life has been a journey of opportunity, and I show some of that journey in my film to each inclusion shouldn't be a lottery. Not to glorify myself, but to show the world what is possible. To disrupt misperception, and to paint a portrait of active participation and interdependence. It's my way of giving back for all the chances I've been given. I agree to make the film not to say I made a film or to best myself in film but to free other non-speaking people to build their own lives as they wish. I used to think freedom was independence, and now I realize freedom is the room to breathe and to grow. Freedom is about connecting with others. Interdependence is hopeful, and involves relating to ourselves as an integral part of something bigger than ourselves. Interdependence makes it possible for us to both get support and meaningfully engage with others. Interdependence follows the heart, not the head, and seeks connections, not divisions. Interdependence makes us feel safer in our own skin. When people need us, we're assessed by them as gold. It's not easy being assisted by others and needing them in order to do our work. But when our work assists others to learn to read and write or to follow their dreams or to understand what they have been misperceiving all along, then we're able to work and to fearlessly hope for better lives for our people. Assistive technology has transformed autistic's ability to meaningfully and actively participate in the broader world. Not only has it brought us together as a political entity, it has also given a voice to the voiceless. Technology usually makes people think about computers and motorized apparatus, and certainly high-tech advances have improved our lives. For example, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network ASAN, uses the Internet to leverage political power efficiently and effectively. Computers and augmentative communication devices have also given alternative communicators a voice that is both easy for everyone to comprehend and efficient and sophisticated enough for us to convey complicated ideas in a timely manner. It allows us to shape the discussions we're having about our people as well as the world around us. Computers and text-to-speech software give us a voice to be heard by large groups of people and each exchange is mutually beneficial. No longer isolated and dependent upon others to advocate for us, we are empowered to make a difference and to represent ourselves. That is self-efficacy. That is freedom in my estimation. Technology can also offer us alternative paths to literacy and a public presence in classes from the beginning. As early as kindergarten, a single switch Big Mac can be used to say, here, each morning during attendance. Board maker can create the picture icons needed in early elementary school to create sentences, paragraphs, stories, reports and poems. Later, technology can help us become expected and valued participants in class discussions in physical science, AP English, or a first year seminar at college. Technology can assist us to present on the nervous system and our voluntary and involuntary movements in anatomy and physiology class or create and co-direct a theater performance. It can also help us keynote, present and advocate at conferences, universities, or on national television. But it needn't always be high-tech. When I was little, I used lots of food labels and photos to tell people what I wanted to understand my choices, and to comprehend where I was going and what we were about to eat. In my case, I needed to be able to touch the words in order to master communication. If I'd been forced to use an iPad early on in my education, 
a lack of proprioceptive feedback and motor precision would have tripped me up. Instead, using hard copies of the icons and words in Velcro Dancer Banks allowed me to pick up the one I needed and place it in the spot where I wanted it to go. In this way, my teachers were able to see what I knew. A small device called a labeler that prints out words as stickers allowed me to make the transition from answer banks to writing on a computer or assistive device. The website for my film describes me as someone who uses a text-to-speech synthesizer to communicate. Yet, in truth, I, and so many of my peers, use a number of tools. Augmentative communication devices, computers with text-to-speech software, our own vocal cords, written language, letter boards, emails, video chats, g-chats, signs, gestures, objects, body movements, pointing, pictures, borrowing others' voices, by choice or by circumstance, even poetry and its oil paint animation in the film. We do not have a word for this kind of flexible communication. People like me are called non-speaking. Sometimes they add an adverb and say, minimally speaking. Uninformed people use the term nonverbal. How can we be nonverbal when we use language every day? When it comes to disability, we're stuck in a binary universe of either or, not and. I want a language of and, a radically interconnected one. What if we thought about communication strategies in this way? And, further, what if we thought about the need to create interdependent opportunities, opportunities that are somehow akin to the lateral network of root bulbs? We need multimodal communication to allow for maximum flexibility and accessibility. If high-tech options were my only means of communication, I wouldn't be where I am today. I use manual sign language to convey my essential commands. Things like, I need to use the bathroom, please stop. Go. I'm done. I need a break. I need something to eat or to drink or more of something. I would never use my assistive technology to quickly tell someone I need to use the bathroom, but often people expect non-speakers to use it first for mundane commands. I think it's not practical as the place to start. We need communication to build relationships. It's those connections that make us thrive. It is this multimodal, rhizomatic approach to communicating, one that reaches out and up, that allows us to thrive and avoid isolation in a world that seeks to contain so-called non-speaking people. For us, communication is only communication when it offers a web of support for ourselves and others. We want to grow that web to create a life of interdependence. We want to both learn and teach. We want to both support and be supported. If we're interdependent, we have satisfying relationships. We're neither alone nor are we strictly dependent on others. It's those relationships, not our ability to produce speech-like sounds, that offer us the safety we need to live. It's important to remember that being non-speaking does not mean we're non-verbal or unable to read and write. It just means that the complex, motor orchestration needed to utter words from our bodies takes longer to master. In the meantime, we have just as much right as anyone else. And perhaps a more urgent need to learn to read and write. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities calls on every country to offer us the assistive technology needed to actively participate in every aspect of life, political, economic, educational, and social. It acknowledges that assistive technology needn't be something fancy to work. It's these kinds of documents that are needed to ensure our human rights are preserved. I challenge us all to leave this room today devoted to a new world. Maybe if we stop thinking of each other as able and disabled, verbal and nonverbal, speaking and non-speaking, and instead, begin thinking of ourselves as a field of diverse and interconnected beings, life can begin anew for all of us. Give thanks for our intricate and communal web of interdependence, self-efficacy, and perseverance. May hope live on in all of us, messily, imperfectly, 
and rhythmatically. Thank you. Thank you very much for thought-provoking remarks and for capturing so vividly the core issue at the heart of today's event. I believe that before concluding this opening session, we are going to see a short excerpt from Mr. Savarese's award-winning documentary. Can we play that? My senses always fall in love. They spin, swoon. They lose themselves in one another's arms. Your senses live alone like bachelors, like bitter, slanted rhymes whose marriage is a sham. Most people still perceive of kids with autism as bad. Until I learned to read and write, people thought I had no mind. People just don't understand, I guess. Trust that they can learn. Reading and writing are rarely taught to non-speaking autistics. You plot to get my people free, hope to help the other kids have meaningful lives. So here's what a dorm room would look like. I plan to go to college. I look hopefully forward to a golden life of full inclusion. Do you currently have students who type to communicate instead of speaking? Um, we do not. Yes, do you look at me as weird or equal? Absolutely equal. Everybody has different things about them. Yes, I fear losing you. Wow, DJ. DJ, we would never desert you. We would never leave you on your own. Imagine for a minute that you are removed from your home for reasons no one bothers to tell you, because you can't speak, so they assume you can't hear or think or feel. The prodigal son has returned, spitting image of a lucky strike whore, snarling, wistful me, who once thought anger was a kind of redemption. You better practice saying it. You got into what? Over number one short. The world outside greets me either as a hopeful exception or as a real burden to society. Or should I fold up fear and go to college individually? Uh, you're just going to grow into it. But only you can do it, Deej. Nobody can do it for you. Being included is every kid's right. It shouldn't be a lottery. brings us to the end of the opening session. I will stay for a while, but it is now my pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Mr. Maher Nasser, Director of Outreach Division at the UN Department of Global Communications. Maher will guide us through the rest of the program. Thank you, and happy World Autism Awareness Day. Thank, thank, thank you, Alison, and, and good morning and welcome to the United Nations. Just maybe a quick note on, on clapping. This is how you clap in this event. So let's, let's observe that in, in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alison, for guiding us through the first part. Thank you, David, for uh, an inspiring and wonderful keynote speak. I'm very pleased to pr introduce the second part of the program this morning and you will soon be diving straight into the first of four moderated discussions on issues related to our overall theme. First, let me how pleased we are to see so many of you here today and to be joined by so many self-advocates among our speakers. Allow me to also express our gratitude to three organizations that have generously offered their support by providing guidance on our approach to this year's observance. They are the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, the Global Autism Project, 
and the Miracle Project. <coughs> Thank you all very much. Your support is deeply valued. I should also like to add special thanks to Jan Herbertson, Jeff Prez, remember, <laughs> and the team for putting this program together. Every year, I think they have done a wonderful job, and, and this year is no exception. As Alison mentioned, the principles at the heart of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities are the guiding light of our annual World Autism Awareness Day observances. This focus on the Convention has enabled us to create a unique platform that we believe adds value to the global discussion of autism, not least by reminding us that in promoting acceptance of autism, we should always be guided by the pursuit of equal enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms by all. In recent years, the observances of World Autism Awareness Day at the United Nations have focused on issues like the right to inclusive education, the right to employment, and the right to autonomy and self-determination. And last year, we focused on empowering women and girls with autism and addressing the many intersecting forms of discrimination that they face. So this year's focus on the right to affordable access to assistive technologies is consistent with and builds on what has gone before. We look forward to an exciting and eye-opening discussion this morning. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping matters. First, I'd like to draw your attention to the quiet room that we have put our disposal across the corridor. It is conference room D, located just across the hall on the same level as we are. We have volunteers in the hallway outside who direct people to the room. So if you need that, please use it. The side doors on both ends can be used and people, volunteers are outside. Second, at the back of the program, you will see suggested hashtags and posts for use on social media. If you are on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag World Awareness, Autism Awareness Day, and hashtag Disability Rights, as well as hashtag CPRD, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And finally, I would like to welcome those who are joining us online. The event is being webcast live on UN Web TV and streamed live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And you can come back to this later. The archive will stay on the UN website. I encourage all of you to share your thoughts via social media. And again, the hashtags World Autism Awareness Day and hashtag disability rights. We will be monitoring Facebook and Twitter and listening closely to your comments. And if there's a chance, maybe the moderators can use those in their discussions. Without further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce the first panel, Communication, a Human Right. Moderating the discussion is Elaine Hall, founder and creative director of the Miracle Project. Elaine is a pioneer in using inclusive theater, film, music, and movement to bring out the best in individuals of all abilities. Joining Elaine are Dr. Julia Ijiogo, clinical director of the Ziba Foundation in Abuja, Nigeria. She is a US trained family physician with global experience in medicine who has been working in the autism field since relating, relocating to Nigeria in 2012. Neil Katz is self-advocate and community teacher at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles. Neil presents nationally and will be participating in an upcoming TEDx talk on autism. Ryan Berman is a communication partner who works with Neil. And then Noor Perviz is the community engagement coordinator of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, where he has been heavily involved in online community bully, building and organizing. Noor's previous work centered on explore, exploring the intersections of disability, LGBT, and religious issues. Elaine, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. 
And thank you to the United Nations for listening to the voices of those who don't often have an opportunity to speak. Today's topic of assistive technology and how it can be used, assistive technology as a human right. David, you so beautifully brought us all together in knowing that this is an inherent human right. And today, to be able to explore how we can bring these technologies to, to the world. I'm very honored to be on this panel with uh, my esteemed colleagues. We are, will be just, just the, the tip of the iceberg in touching on this topic, and I encourage you to reach out to them further for the amazing work that they are doing. Dr. Ajigu, you're the clinical director of, down there, <laughs> you're the clinical director of the Ziba Foundation, and you're a US trained family doctor who, after discovering that there were inadequate services for children on the spectrum, you relocated to Nigeria. You appear throughout the media, and you've developed an autism care support initiative. Can you tell us how assistive technology is part of the human rights policies and cultural acceptance in Nigeria? Thank you very much for the question, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I want to also thank the Global Autism Project for making this possible. Uh, we're very pleased to be here. Um, so back home in Nigeria, um, knowing that we are, uh, we've been uh, signatories to the um, convention for um, the rights of persons with disabilities since, I believe, 2007. Um, we've done our part to at least agree that we want this um, done. We want to be part of it. Well, assistive technology in our part of the world, as you know, is, is with autism awareness evolving. In, we've come from um, awareness being next to nothing to being something that is getting bigger. Right now in our country, there's several programs going on to, to uh, bring attention to this um, situation. Um, I would say our goal for now is to focus on um, the awareness that it's available, to focus on the fact that children, individuals, persons on the autism spectrum can actually go beyond um, just being kept away. Um, they can live independent lives. They can be more self-reliant if these technologies are part and parcel of their lives. And also to ensure, you know, our thought process is that we can actually start from low technology, um, um, assistive technologies, glasses, as I'm using right now, is an assistive technology to help me see. Um, things for children on the spectrum would be pencil grips, lined paper, highlighters, you know, the simple things, just being aware that it is possible to help children, individuals, to not only um, exist as we want to look at, to, to see them in the past, but to actually enjoy life to actually go to school and enjoy school. And um, that is where our focus is at this time, I believe, in Nigeria. Ernesto, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you and, and to hear your, your passion and your commitment to the work being done and that you're doing in, in Latin America as a, as a psychologist, as an author, and as a professor. You are dedicated to improving the quality of life for individuals on the spectrum. Could you share a little bit about what you're doing and, um, and how assistive technology is part of the human rights policies and cultural acceptance in Latin America? Um, we are far from seeing the right of so-called disabled people in a genuine way as part of people's fundamental rights. From the point of view of neurodiversity, we know that the concept of disability 
must be overcome, emphasizing on giving an adequate solution to the needs of each individual, giving way to the full development of their capabilities and potentialities. Assisted technologies level the disadvantage of the environment and allow access to the free exercise of rights and freedoms in equality with other citizens. The vision of inclusion that exists in Latin America, unfortunately, is far from a view of coexistence that should exist at the foundation. The included person is seen from a normalizing point of view where he, she is the one who must adapt to, uh, to the environment. We are far from making adjustments to the curriculum, to evaluation, and to the creation of individualized educational programs. There is no acceptance of the other, of the autistic person in this case, of someone with whom we must learn to live together in respect for their particular way of perceiving the world and interacting. In the current debate of, on autism, in our countries, autistic people are systematically excluded from discussion about their needs and future. I know um, Dr. Cecilia Brownbar brought us together, and one of the things that she said was just like someone who is challenged with walking needs to have a wheelchair to assist them or a walker, we need to be able to provide the technological access to our individuals on the autism spectrum to be able to be part of society. And the work that you're doing just clearly shows the dedication that's happening in Latin America. So thank you so much. Neil Katz, Neil, I'd, I'd like to show a video about you for a second. Is that okay with you to show, yeah, yeah? So Neil um, is a self-advocate, a public speaker, and a performer. Um, he was one of the featured stars in the um, HBO award-winning film, Autism the Musical. And he's, he's grown up quite a bit since then, is now working. And I'd like to just show, I'd like to just show a little clip of Neil at work. And as what David was saying, being able to use an iPhone on his phone, an app that allows him for immediate communication. A 19-year-old with a special form of autism has found a new way to express himself. CBS 2's Stephanie Simmons shows us how new technology has helped improve his life. I work at Camp J.C. Shalom in Malibu every Thursday. I plant trees, pick fruits, turn over planter boxes, and lay down drip irrigation. 19-year-old Neil Katz has nonverbal autism. He can't speak, but thanks to help from modern technology, he found his voice. Hello, boss. He uses an app that helps translate his thoughts into words. I'm ready for work. Okay, let's go. And thanks to the staff at the Shalom Institute, One, two. he found his footing. Three. Because of your so that was kind of an old, it shows how quickly technology is growing. That was a number of years ago, and it was a brand new thing. Um, kind, so thoughtful, and so smart. He's also extremely respectful. I have learned so much about Neil and from Neil, and I am truly honored and proud to call you my friend. <laughs> And Neil, if at any time you want to comment on this, please, you know, know that you can. We're here with you. Dr. Jugu, what are some of the barriers to the use of technology in, in Nigeria? And I know that in the United States, we, are, we do have a lot of access. And um, how, what steps have you taken to help remedy the situation? In Nigeria, um, uh, like I mentioned previously, um, West Africa generally, the biggest challenge for us would be knowledge, just awareness, really. Um, we um, are getting there because um, even though you mentioned we have a lot of access here in the US, I'm wondering whether in this room we do know that Africa um, jumped from the analog 
um, phone technology um, um, infrastructure and went straight into um, digital. So the mobile network is very, very um, vibrant there. And because of that, we are um, optimistic, extremely optimistic, that in spite of the lack of awareness, if we begin to um, educate people much more through that medium, um, I, I'll have you know that 50% of Africans you have a mobile phone, way down from the cities into the rural areas. So they are familiar with apps and programs and internet, internet use. Well, 10% may be the only internet users, maybe, but really they're familiar with the use of apps and they're very comfortable with using um, technology. Um, this is also a big way that we have been able to work with the Global Autism Project to do our work. It's through you know, the use of WhatsApp to have our clinical supervisors um, train us, oversee our work that we do. So um, even though the barriers are awareness, most parents don't believe that um, you know, what we've seen today is possible, we can actually um, capitalize on this nugget of being you know, f front and center of, of um, having this vibrant uh, mobile network to do more education, provide more awareness, and at the end of the day, close the gaps that exist between our continent and this part of the world. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, I, as I'm thinking, Dr. Jigu, um, in the United States as well, in North America, there's still a huge community that does not have the access and that often, as Neil and David touched on, um, understand what we're experiencing here, the intelligence that is inherent in, in all human beings and the rights to be able to share that. Right. So I, I just, what you're doing is in so essential and important. Um, Ernesto, what, what are the, some of the barriers that, that you have experienced in Latin America and, and what are the ways um, we hear about the global autism network that has just been phenomenal and around the world? And, but what are the ways that other organizations and, and society as a whole can act to respect the fact that communication is a human right, including the use of AAC? out is I had uh, the opportunity to travel and get to know different countries and realities in Latin America. The access to assistive technologies is scarce in its diffusion and knowledge. This scarcity increased dramatically in the economically less favored sectors. The cause, broadly speaking, can be summarized as follows. One, lack of knowledge and support from the government. I'll talk progress have made have been made in the last 10 years in terms of knowledge, awareness, and respect for autism, we still have a long way to go and we will not be able to achieve a genuine quality of life for autistic people without real public policies. Second, lack of trained professional in the use of assistive technology. Most speech therapists and psychologists have no knowledge of the principles of general communication, so, their vision is entirely fixed on oral language. Many autistic people, especially the non-speaking ones, suffer long years in speech therapies with no result without being taught some system of augmentative alternative communication. The panlinguistic vision leads to these people not having access to a communicate code according to their needs and possibilities excluding them as autonomous and independent subjects and from the government of their own lives. Third, ignoring the needs and demands of the autistic people population itself. Autistic people are not seen as people who can decide individually or collectively. The motto, nothing about us without us, is not incorporated to our societies. There survive a paternalistic vision that infantilizes the autistic person in their needs and desires. We believe that access to assistive technology will reverse this undesirable situation. Thank you. Thank you. 
Noor, what, what barriers do self-advocates experience and, and what policies are being put in place to protect their rights to use that technology? difficult for autistic individuals to access and use assistive technology in the U.S. for many reasons. Many schools do not have assistive technology like AAC readily available due to a lack of income or ignorance of the law. Many students have to fight to get access to the tools they need to be most included in school. Very often, students of color in particular are punished or imprisoned rather than diagnosed with a disability which also limits their ability to access assistive technology. As people age, there is also more bureaucracy involved in accessing communication supports, and it makes it hard to gain access to the technology that is best suited to our needs, and often it is impossible to afford. And uh, Neil. How has assistive technology allowed you to impact others? And how does assistive technology give you the power of choice? I am employed by UCLA as a community teacher for an autism and media class. People with autism who type to communicate work with undergraduate students to create a documentary about autism. Typing lets me and my fellow community teachers provide missing information and share our thoughts and stories. I find rare belief in outsiders who watch someone type with a communication partner. Thanks to us, the students who seemed skeptical at first are now believers. Thanks to assistive technology, I am saved from living a life where other people tell me what to do and where to go. When I have made up my mind about where or what I want to eat, I take out my iPhone and select the corresponding icon on my app and I am on my way. Filling free time would almost be hell if I could not communicate how I want to fill my time. Nobody even would have known that I want to be an actor or learn to bake if I was not able to type it. Choice is what defines a real life. I feel most human when I am in control. I can tell people exactly what I think instead of making them guess. For example, I changed my living situation and my support team and I am much happier. Kind of awesome to live in my own place. I also am doing my own thing during some days, instead of being stuck in my day program. I type about who I want to spend time with and what I want to do with my time and my life. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Ryan, you're, you're also the program director for the Miracle Project, and you see others use their communication devices uh, in, in the classes with the Miracle Project and in support of, of Neil. How do you see relationships among speaking people and non-speakers deepen as a result of using the technology mm -hmm. in the classes and in other social environments? Mm -hmm. So I want to speak about a young man who, when he came to the Miracle Project, he didn't have an effective communication system in place. We did know that he was enjoying himself from the uh, copious amounts of smiles he displayed, but we really didn't know who he was as an individual. Over time, while in our classes, he began to type. And we discovered that he has an extremely unique talent um, with assistive technology, he types song lyrics. And so he created a song with our music director. They worked together on the music. Um, the young man wrote all the lyrics. And then in our show, we sang the song, did a dance, and his words were heard by everybody. Um, now, instead of introducing himself as a young man with autism, he says, I am a young man who is an actor and a songwriter. Neil also participates in the Miracle Project classes, and through his iPhone, he's able to share his wants and his needs. 
And we also often create short films to highlight everybody in the production, whether or not they're able to go on stage that day. So Neil is able to type out his lines and then we program them into the iPhone and he does his lines exactly when he's supposed to. Exactly. <laughs> and he is on camera acting like just everybody else in the class. Because of this, his uh, fellow students are able to see him as a thinking person and somebody who is just another student with them in class. They are fully part of the Miracle Project community and we don't see them as only actors. We see them as leaders. Thank you. Uh, I've asked all of you to prepare a closing statement and um, you're, you are all such experts in your field and have so much to offer and we're limited in time. So I, I encourage you to, to follow up on, on the esteemed panelists. But if, if you could leave us with something, um, Noor, you, you're the Autism Self-Advocate Network's Community Engagement Coordinator and a multimodality communicator. Uh, I'm wondering what, what is it something, a policy that's important for us to know or something that you would like to leave us with? One thing that audiences can do to make a difference in their own country is to prioritize getting non-speaking individuals to the table of conversations that need to involve us, such as panels talking about the rights of non-speaking people, and to listen to non-speaking people about how to be a good ally and how to boost our voices. You can find more information about the organization I work for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you wanted to say? Um, or were you leaving people with their information? Um, I think that's okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. And um, Dr. Jugu, what would you like to leave us with for closing thoughts? So um, the last time I was here speaking, I had said, there's an old proverb that says, if you give a man a fish, you make him satisfied for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, then you give him a life, an occupation, and you keep him satisfied for a lifetime. So capacity building in our part of the world is extremely essential. You know, how to use assistive technology is very, very important. And we just encourage, you know, organizations who are interested in doing this for uh, people in Nigeria, um, such as the Global Autism Project, keeps doing and doing extremely well um, to, in, to do that because we do need to learn how to use these and help uh, people with autism in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the Global Autism Project uh, is that web that David spoke about. Um, Neil, do you have a closing statement for us? first time I typed, I was terrified and excited about the possibility of real communication. Through tons of hard work, I have become an expert and I have been made whole. I use these superpowers to teach others the value of communication technology. This technology also gives me the power of choice. To people who do not believe we are smart, I say you should take the time to get to know me or someone else who types. For my life to be complete, I must have access to assistive technology and people who are willing to listen. Technology saved me from a life of boredom and loneliness. It is about more than wants and needs. It is about thoughts and questions and emotions and opinions and living the human experience. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our experiences. Thank you, Neil. Ernesto. Yes. Um. Assisted technologies are the tool for millions of voiceless people to provide of the possibility of claiming their rights, expressing their emotions, conquering their desire. Electronic, writing, spoken, typed, graphic voice that expect from us, from the neurotypical world, the empathy of listening to them, reading them, interpreting them, and the struggle for the them never to return to silence to those who still condemn obsolete methods and prejudice of the past. 
we must give the choice about which methods and technologies should be used to the families of autistic people, but above all, to them. We must bring down the figure of experts who believe they know more than those who leave autism from within. We must embrace the techniques that allow us, us to live together in respect for the free choice of how to communicate as a space for the dialogue and no longer for imposition. The technologies of our electronic world are allowing us to create a life for all boys. Let us dare to listen starting today and forever. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our esteemed panelists and to Jan Erbertson for gathering us all together. So thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to share a video um, highlighting uh, the words of Ido Kedar, who is a self-advocate, a university student, an author, um, an inspiration to me, um, and a motivator, and a dear friend. Um, Ido, video. I am an unspeaking autism advocate. For the first seven years of my life I received the conventional autism treatments, to little progress. Then I was taught to touch letters to communicate, first on a letter board, then tablet, allowing me to excel in a regular academic curriculum. In my teen years I wrote my first book, Edo in Autism Land. I am honored to address you virtually today. My message to you all is to separate the ability to speak from intelligence. Not talking is not the same as not thinking. I believe thousands of autistic people are like me, trapped by a motor system that has poor linkage to the brain's commands for movement. That makes us under-responsive, for example, not being able to speak or move gracefully, or over-responsive, as an impulsive or odd-looking motor compulsions. The result is a trapped soul who is educated like a toddler, receiving rudimentary lessons that never progress. Imagine yourselves, with your fully intact intelligence, trapped like this. Your mouth taped shut. Your hands in baseball gloves. You can't talk, write or gesture and everyone assumes you need baby talk because they mistake the motor trap for language processing or a cognitive issue. We can't cure autism. But at least we can set some of these trapped people free by teaching them how to communicate by touching letters. This is no easy process. This takes expert instruction, lots of practice and patience. It is not merely enough to buy a device or get a letter board because the autistic person is motor trapped and needs to learn how to move to the letters. It starts with the recognition that not talking is not the same as not thinking. Give us the benefit of the doubt. I have been typing to communicate for 15 years. I still can only use one finger. It is a motor struggle, as you will see. But in this way I got a normal education and wrote two books. In this way, I am free. Communication is a basic human right. Wow, beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Peru. Uh, Elaine will moderate the second communication panel, so thank you again for Imagine. double duty. Uh, the second panel is on technology and training, and we'll be introducing the panelists as they join her. While the panelists join Elaine uh, at the podium, uh, as a lead into the discussion, we are pleased to have two brief interventions from Soma Mukopadaya. Padiaya of the Halo Clinic in Austin, Texas, and her son Tito Rajishi Mukahopadi Padiai. Sorry to have massacred your name. 
they were unable to uh, be here with us today in person, but have sent the videos presenting their contribution to the discussion. As, as many of you will, will know, SOMA is the creator of the rapid prompting uh, method of teaching communication to non or minimally verbal autistic children. And in the video, she briefly describes some of the tools used. Tito is the author of a number of books, including How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? Inside My Autistic Mind. Let's roll the video and then Elaine will take it with the panel. Thank you. I'm Soma Mukhopadhyay and I develop rapid prompting method. In this method, I teach the student academics and empower the student a means to express what they learned, their understanding, their reasoning, so that they can communicate their thoughts. So for this, I use the prompts and the prompts that are involved in rapid prompting method are the visual prompt of a number board if they have to uh, communicate the numbers and mathematical uh, concepts over there. The visual, the visual prompt of the letter board where they learn to spell, they learn to uh, add, uh, the motor skill to move and navigate their hands and spell the uh, right spelling and demonstrate what they are learning. Sometimes they use the visual prompt of a stencil board so, so that and then they use the pencil as a tactile prompt and to initiate a response and then they try to spell. Now, once they get good with this, then we move on to the keyboard. Keyboard. Now, but the keyboard has so many keys, so the student has to learn to ignore the irrelevant keys and push the right button. So, that is again a motor skill. So, in rapid prompting method, we try to grow the student's motor skills so that it can grow towards independent spelling. Now I, I am honored to introduce our, and it's actually a great lead-in of showing a, a form of training for technology. And so I'm, I'm honored to introduce our next panel, uh, Ms. Darlene Hansen, Director of Communication Services for REACH, R-E-A-C-H. Mr. Michael Huang, founder of the U-Plus Academy in Nanjing, China. Ms. Chloe Rothschild, self-advocate, national speaker, and member of the board of the ARC, United States. And then afterwards, we'll be seeing, um, we'll, we'll be introduced to Payam Kosravi, who will be presenting towards the end of the panel. Thank you all. I'm, I'm really honored to be with you and uh, to you're all such leaders in the work that you're doing in very diverse areas. We, we spoke a lot in the first half of the morning about uh, the use of technology for non-speaking individuals. But as you'll hear in this panel and what um, Dr. Ajigu uh, really emphasized as well is the, the importance of lower technology and other forms that, that individuals, not only for the non-speaking population and individuals with autism, 
but also the use of, of technology to enhance, and when we think about it, how m most of us are multimodality communicators in that we use sign language and we are on our phone, and so how technology can enhance the lives of, of all individuals with autism, speaking and not. So Darlene, as a lead-in, we, we, we just saw one form of uh, communication, mm -hmm. uh, teaching to type, and I know there are many, many forms. Can, and you have been a leader in assistive technology. I mean, I don't want to embarrass you, but, but for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, the kind of the unsung hero of, of helping our, our friends and family members to communicate. Can, can you share a little bit about um, the different styles and ways that communication can be helpful? Yeah, yes. Um, well, kind of go, piggybacking on what you have just alluded to and what Dr. Ju was talking about, it's important for everyone to understand that assistive technology doesn't have to be a piece of equipment with a battery in it. It can be a piece of paper with a, some kind of symbol system on it, a picture, a uh, drawing, um, a, any kind of symbolization that would work for the individual. It could be an object. And so in some, when we start talking about funding in that, that can be a little more resourceful for individuals. Uh, it, technology then can move all the way into technology like the iPads or there are um, vendors that create fancier devices that cost, of course, more money. Um, but in addition to the technology, as we can see in, in the presentation by Soma and Tito and, and DJ and, uh, and Neil and such and all the other communicators who are using the technology, it's, it's not just about the technology, it's also about accessing the technology. Mm -hmm. And for the persons who are the most impacted by their autism, we now know the story's kind of um, grown from it started as a behavioral story about autism, and it's grown into a motor difference has been added to the definition. And this motor difference that the individuals are experiencing creates difficulty for them to access any kind of technology that we give them a lot of the time. And so with that understanding, A, we need to have education to, in, to others and professionals to understand that they need to incorporate that information and, and look at, is that maybe what's impacting this person's ability to communicate? And then also, B, understand how to um, train professionals to start teaching individuals how to communicate, in, including the motor difference that they have. So when DJ and Tito and Neil learn to communicate, they were learning a different, a, a, um, to change the way they are accessing their thinking through their motor planning system. Yeah. Um, the, the way their system works, their speech doesn't always work, but their thinking can work. And I think that's what, um, I think it was Neil talked about, in B, well, DJ too, being able to think things and not be able to say them. That's a motor difference. I think, I mean, that's such an essential point that I know that fortunately the World Autism Awareness Day has, has um, changed people's perceptions and now we're moving even further that autism isn't a behavior disorder. It's, it's, it's a movement, challenges with the body in movement that can in, impair um, and, and cause behaviors, which I don't even like using that word. And I think by clearly demonstrating the advances in technology, we're able to almost bypass and allow the body to be, as you said, to be, um, uh, to, to find those pathways to be able to communicate, so. There's, there's individuals who are given technology and appear to not be able to use it because of their motor differences. Mm -hmm. And so then they are being denied access to their communication systems or their ability to learn and be educated because just giving them the piece of technology doesn't fix the autism difficulty that they're living with. Right, right. So the patience that's needed in the person and the understanding and perseverance of both the, the, the people using the technology as well as the um, educators. Yes. Yeah. Um, Chloe, you're a public speaker. I've had the good fortune to hear you speak many times and uh, I'm a big fan. Um, 
you are also a speaking person. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell me, please, wh why, tell us, please, why did you start to use an augmentative device, a communication device? Having a communication device ensures and allows me to have a voice Hello. when words are heard. The device is connected. Communication device ensures and allows me to have a voice even when words are hard. Using a communication device is not something that I ever would have pictured myself doing, had you asked me eight years ago, because I am so very verbal. But, once I started using one, and talked it through with trusted professionals, it made sense. I'm so articulate, but writing is easier. There's been for years that I could write things, but I couldn't say them, and we didn't know why. And then we, I, I used a device, and it really helped, and I was able to type out where it hurts, and and do many more things with it. And it's been life changing. Mr. Huang, yes. uh, what is the need? You, you have developed online trainings um, and through U Plus Academy. And um, what is the need for those trainings? And how do you provide interactive technologies and on-site training for teachers? And if you could also share about how the technology helps teachers and children in China. Well, yes. Because we know that uh, China is a big country with 1.4 billion people and 17 new boys every year. So what we do in China is that uh, we provide interactive, interactive technologies, including something like uh, interactive projection system, gesture control system, uh, and virtual reality system, and multi-touch system as well. So we provide these to the uh, rehabilitation centers and then we will be able to let teachers be uh, able to teach, to train children uh, more efficiently. And so, because in China, there are also many uh, families will be hard to get resources from uh, experts, professionals. So we created a uh, program called Parallel Education, and then we provide this to many families and teachers so for the parents, even they stay in, a, far, in a, a very small town, far away from main cities, they can still get individual education programs from experts in main cities. So they don't need to move, they don't need to relocate to big cities, and then they'll be able to help them to save a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, they can also uh, train themselves because we also supply online training on a daily basis. So during this 30 minutes daily uh, live video, uh, all the parents that they can get training, uh, they can get uh, some knowledges, gain more insights into the basics of scientific professional training ways of skills. Mm -hmm. And they can also even ask questions and get timely response from experts. So that it's, the technology is making all kinds of aspects, not only for speaking, but being mm -hmm. able to yes. understand autism right, yeah. in a way that had not previously been uh, occurring in China. Right, yes. So because we also working with uh, uh, some big uh, organizations, such as Globalism Project, and like uh, uh, Relaxed Learning, we work with uh, RBT, we work with BCBAs, so we work with them together uh, and our development team in China, let's say our engineers, programmers, we all work together mm -hmm. and then we'll be able to uh, combine, we can say uh, advanced theory, combine with applied technologies together so we can create uh, things to, uh, uh, to centers, to teachers and also to families. Mm -hmm. So we're really expanding our understanding of what assistive technology is and the reach. Um, Chloe, 
if you could give a, you give a couple examples of how your communication device has positively impacted your life and something that you found that, you've, that you perhaps may have struggled with while using your device. I've, um, oftentimes people would think like when, when my stomach hurt and I was hitting my stomach, there, I was really trying to tell us that it really hurt and using my device, I was able to tell us more and more how it hurt and we were able to figure out with doctor's help that it was my bladder and I've been able to introduce myself to people and to use it when at a job and I'm able to answer more abstract questions which can be hard versus concrete questions and when I don't have the verbal words or get stuck to answer something or someone doesn't understand my single word response, I'm able to use my device to tell them versus getting frustrated. But it's been hard to deal with the, and think of the judgment of others and worry about what they would think. And I've had to get past that and worrying that they would say, just tell me and don't use your device. So a lot of it is other people's perceptions. I mean, I'm hearing how important it is for our medical professionals here and, and across the globe that to have something in, in your offices so that a person that is, um, I mean, many of us prefer to type, you know, or use our phone and just how important that can be especially for, for individuals on the spectrum, whether they're speaking or not speaking. Um, also, you've shared with me before that um, how speaking, often speaking people have benefited and they never even knew how much they could benefit from having a device. Do you want to tell any of that? That's okay. Yeah, we've seen, such, my family and I have seen such a language increase in such an ability to answer questions more where I used to say I, I, I don't know even when I knew now I'll go to the device or I'm even able to answer more and more verbally than I was um, and people are really able to know how much I know and, and it also has helped increase words in language as a whole. It's not decreasing speech like we often th think because it's actually hard work to type and find e or find e each icon. So if I can verbally tell you, I would. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Darlene, I'd love for you to comment, you know, a, a bit on that from your experiences and how assistive technology really enhances um, people speaking as well as um, uh, non-speakers. And, and also, what barriers still remain that it prohibit individuals with autism from having access to technology and getting the training they need? And what can be done to help eliminate those barriers? Well, I think, um, Chloe, you're a great example for all the people out there. Chloe's not the only person, I think, that I know um, that uh, has some speech and people, professionals, teachers, um, some families even, will think that then the communication system is equipped, that speech is the way to go. And what we see is if we use visual systems or assistive technology systems, that people can, can express more. Um, so it's important not to deny individuals that opportunity um, to explore that because the, if we just take uh, the, the situation as, as a speech and language issue, as in verbal speech, spoken speech, however we want to call it, um, as that's the only means of output that's credible and useful and reliable, we're actually limiting an opportunity for many, many people. The same thing happens in assistive technology for written language. So we have students in schools, for example, who are learning to write physically, but can't keep up with the curriculum with their penmanship. Mm -hmm. If you give them technology and you allow them to type, even if they're a first grader, 
now they're going to be able to participate. So people are having their, their uh, educational experiences limited by what other people have decided is the acceptable norm, and they're often being held to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, it, you, uh, technology is now universal for all of us, um, but in our educational system, we still think of it as kind of a developmental thing. Right. Um, and for individuals who have difficulty with their motor systems in written language or spoken language, they uh, can actually use the technology to keep up and in the learning experiences, and we see less and less of an educational need um, as far as learning differences go. Mm -hmm. I think some of the barriers that, that, that kind of goes to the barriers that we're experiencing, there are some professional organizations that we um, live with that are creating statements and such that are denying um, some individuals access to technology and to trained communication partners and such so that they aren't allowed to learn to access and to use their technology. And I think that's really important for us to all know that people are, are, who are using the methods like Soma's using or the methods like I train on, um, that is a learning curve. We're, we're assuming there's going to be a learning curve. And if we're not allowed or promoted or supported to learn more about the need for that training, um, we're actually ending up denying that human right of communication to individuals. Mm -hmm. True, it's, it's, it's an essential human right. I mean, I was thinking about, um, you know, with Chloe, with you typing and then speaking, I mean, how many of us prefer to write things out? I mean, when we're presenting or speaking, we write our speech out first and then we, we talk it. So to deny someone that, we, we all need accommodations, right? And, and so it normalizes it. And um, as an essential human right to be able to um, have that accessible and supported by organizations, um, yeah. Um, Mr. Wang, you, you have developed an app for parents which provides online IEP training mm -hmm. to support parents. And how has this benefited parents and how do you feel other societies can benefit from these technologies? Well, yes, uh, we create uh, parallel education to help parents just because most of parents they have the motivation to learn by themselves, so they can gain all the uh, technologies and gain all the uh, skills to help their own child. And meanwhile, uh, they just need some one-on-one -on -one support from the experts. Mm. So from the internet, from the app, they will be able to get those help timely. And so they can also even build a diary for their child, and then they will be able to see the daily programs and, and one more amazing thing in that, we can also use the app to help the parents to track data. So they can uh, keep track of data of what going on, what's going on with their child and see the programs, see the progress, and they can see uh, some graphs to know, to understand how the child's changing. Mm -hmm. And so I do believe that uh, even for Chinese government can also be involved in those kind of a promotion of using new technologies. And of course, you, we all know that in China, the most people, they like innovative uh, innovations like uh, new technologies, and also for the mobile uh, phones are very popular in China. So we do believe that uh, what happened, what we are doing right now in China can also be something that can be uh, applied in somewhere else. Beautiful. Um, we're, we're limited in time again today, so please follow up with these esteemed guests. And um, Darlene, if there is a, a brief closing statement you'd like to leave us with. I think that uh, for, for everyone should have access to technology that needs it, of course. Um, and I think that it does, we don't have to be afraid of the cost. I think it can be looked at as a low-tech system. It can be just as valuable as a high-tech system for an individual. But I think that we need to remember that it's not limiting a person to create a system that is dependent on technology or a communication partner. What is, that, what is limiting is to create a system that doesn't allow people to communicate what they're thinking. Mm. Those individuals, those adults, are the ones that are being um, limited right. with that right for communication. Right. Um, 
Mr. Huang, did you have any closing statement you wanted to say? Yes, because we are working uh, as many centers that we can in China to apply uh, online or remote uh, support. So uh, we really want uh, there are many uh, Chinese centers, teachers, therapists, doctors can join us. And we also welcome uh, global partners to help us. And then we could, you know, we can, we can make change together. Thank you. Thank you. And Chloe, your voice is so important. Can you close us out of, these, of our communication? There's so much more to communication than just being able to speak. Think about it. You have to have the words and be able to use them to tell people your wants, dreams, hopes, goals, likes, and dislikes. And it can be hard with just words. So we're su supporting and providing multi-tools as communication. It's not taking place of speech. It's helping. It ensures that everyone has a voice and a way to be heard, even when speaking up is hard. I ask that you please consider and accept all forms of communication and listen to everyone's every voice and take meaning to it, no matter what way it comes out. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Um, we're we're going to finish this part of the morning with, um, and then there, we have an incredible ne next uh, afternoon um, with Payam Kosravi, who is a young man, and uh, he really takes advantage of every moment that life provides. Payam gave a presentation at Georgia Tech last year and typed live in front of an audience of over 200 people. Um, as we were expressing here, it's challenging to type live because of the motor planning. And it was incredibly courageous and clearly shows, Payam, your, your commitment to, um, and dedication to really changing the way people perceive individuals on the spectrum with autism. Um, Payam's mother, Parisa, is a former CNN senior vice president in charge of international news coverage. And Payam is um, going to be, these are his words that Parisa will be reading as we watch the video. So please welcome Payam Kosravi. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, can we turn the main microphone on, please? And in your seats, there are ear shells that you're welcome to use. Do you want to use my mic here? No, nope, there's no one right here. Okay. Oh, it might be on, I don't know. It's got a little red circle, so. Hello, everyone. I'm Parisa Khosravi, Payam's mom. Payam is compassionate, He's wise, he's on the autism spectrum, and he's non-speaking. Three years ago, at the age of 14, we had a communication breakthrough. Payam now communicates by typing on a keyboard. My joy and passion as a journalist and news executive for three decades was the opportunity to give voice to the voiceless. It has now taken a completely different meaning as I advocate for my son and his peers, or as he calls them, the other silent champions, to ensure their voices are heard. Payam's name actually means message in Farsi, in Persian. Payam has asked me to read his message to you on his behalf. For a long time, I did not have an opportunity to share my ideas, thoughts, or opinions. Now, after years of practice, 
I'm able to type out many different sentiments. Manifesting beliefs is most certainly a basic human right non-speakers are denied. Here's a large group of individuals that need support and unconventional methods to be able to contribute to our global society. The more awareness we can all spread, the more those without voices can be understood. Silent communicators are found in all cultures. The bigger our community becomes, the more we can be accepted in our world's future. Most people are granted opportunities to access the necessary tools needed to develop a means for communication. However, it is more challenging for those of us who are mastering how to successfully harness motor systems, sensory overload, and stubborn-minded people. Learning how to communicate effectively requires careful attention and supportive communication partners. Not everyone who meets me is able to recognize the depth that lies behind my silent or otherwise quirky facade. Those barriers are majorly inhibiting for those like me. The important thing for everyone to do is remain open-minded, curious, and willing to continuously grow and evolve. With this desire to support those with communication differences, many opportunities will begin to develop for individuals that deserve to be included. And you must understand, there are many of us. We look different, we move different, and we sound different, but we're all capable of learning. Beginning to communicate was more about developing the skills to accurately point and answer questions reliably. Once those skills were easier for me, I was able to progress to using keyboards that were synced to an iPad. Responding this way gives me a more appropriate tool to use around peers. When one is dependent on assistance to participate, it is always wise to have a variety of tools to use. For every person, these tools may look different, but the goal should always be to find the most accessible option and provide the individual chances to use their preferred tool. As I previously wrote for an education conference, the time has come for professionals and educators to take advice from advocates with personal experiences with chaotic impulses. Try to imagine what life would be like living without direct control over words, limbs, and motor actions. This way of living is all I know. But nothing is worse than being perceived as less capable than you truly are. My friends and I have dealt with this lack of honest understanding most of our lives. Try to see past this and ask yourself what more could be missing, what strategies could be used to support an individual in school, home, or the community. The more we talk about this as a community, the better. Every single person interacting with those with brain-body disconnect can have an impact on our lives. There must be fundamental changes in our belief in all of humanity. Treating individual people as though they not only matter, but can make a difference in this world is essential. Help make this happen. My dream is for the entire world to abolish the pain those experience from unnecessary judgments because of each person's unique differences. People need to recognize how their attitudes are negatively impacting our growth for humanity as a whole. Payam. Thank you so much. And Payam is here in, in our audience, and we, we thank you, Payam. And um, I just learned about you over the internet through Dr. Barry Prezant, and I, I'm so glad you, you came. And thank you so very much to all of our panelists. One, two, one, two. There we go. Good thank you so much, Elaine Hall, for your moderation. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Payam, would you mind just standing up and so we can thank you properly for that beautiful statement? with your mom together if you want. Thank you, Payam.
Thank you, Mom, for de delivering for him. Thank you very much. All right, so how is everyone feeling? Okay. All right, we have two more great conversations. I'm going to take over as moderator now. And then, so I'm going to invite the next speakers up. The next uh, conversation is going to be about the very crucial question of independent living. And the speakers are Finn Gardner, a community educator. Finn, and come on up to the podium. Hopefully, uh, they'll put your names on the podium. But if not, just take your, your, your seat uh, wherever you like. Hopefully, your names will come up, though. He's a community educator, researcher, advocate, and designer. He currently serves as research associate at the Lurie Institute for Disability Policy at Brandeis University's Heller School for Social Policy. He's also a policy fellow at the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Tom Island, Tom, give us a big raised hand, is a self-advocate. He's an author and a national speaker. He's a graduate of California State University Northridge and also a certified public public accountant, hashtag CPA. Sangeeta Jain. Sangeeta Jain is Joint Secretary of SOREM in India, the Society for Rehabilitation of Mentally Challenged, and the mother of a teenage autistic boy. <laughs> Judy Mark is a member of the Faculty of the Disability Studies Department at UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, and co-founder and president of Disability Voices United. Oh, the names have come up. And also, uh, I'm not Ramu, but I am going to sit there. We lost Ramu, so I'm going to be moderating today. So if uh, our technician at the top can remove Ramu's name, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. And originally from Spain, do we have Remy? We're not sure if Remy made it into the building and made it with us today. Uh, but we'll keep our fingers crossed that he is able to join us. And uh, when he does, I will introduce him. So I'm going to move from the mic over to that chair over there. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, so as I said, we're going to be talking about independent living and a little bit of background. Because you know all of our conversations here are rooted in the Convention on the Rights of Persons in Disabil uh, with Disabilities. And that's a crucial uh, anchor for the points that we're making here. So uh, taking this conversation or starting the conversation with the Convention itself, Article 19 of the Convention addresses the right of all persons with disabilities to live independently and to be included in the community. We're not talking about what I would like to do, what it would be nice to do. We're talking about basic human rights that everyone has and that governments have the responsibility to deliver to people and to communities and to families. So on our panel, we're going to discuss access to assistive technology that helps people with autism to live independently and uh, that can support, uh, provide support for a wide range of needs, including self-determination, education, employment, safety in the home, executive functioning, just to name a few. So uh, I think we're going to start with Finn. Are we ready to go? Sure. Um, so tell us about uh, your life and uh, what was your life like without assistive technology and how has assistive technology uh, changed your life and allowed you to be more independent? Okay, so I use a number of different technologies to allow me to live in the community as both um, a professional and as um, an autistic person myself. So um, I use apps to help me like keep track of time because sometimes I struggle with time management as an executive functioning difficulty. Sometimes um, if I am under extreme, extreme stress, um, I'll have tr trouble speaking. Usually I don't, but if I do, then um, I use Proloco to go, which, which is an app that was mentioned um, a few different times by several people um, earlier today. I use that sometimes if um, I really, really need something else other than speech, other, or I'll write. That's, the other, that's my other method. Um, I, and there's some other sort of unorthodox assistive technologies that I use. Um, they may not necessarily be considered assistive technologies in the same way that, say, a talking app would be, but they're also helpful. Um, for example, um, sometimes I, because of those aforementioned um, exec, executive functioning difficulties I have, sometimes I need to 
use, for example, ride sharing as opposed to dealing with public transit and having to deal with a million different transfers just to make it to, say, a doctor's appointment. So I'll, so in this way, Uber or Lyft are assistive technologies in a sort of set in a sort of a lateral way. Um, and I'll. <laughs> And I also find things like social media or texting or emailing are helpful for me to communicate, um, for me to handle difficult conversations that I have a hard time handling orally, kind of like what Chloe was talking about earlier. Sometimes if I'm talking about something really difficult, I'll just like clam up and then like, I need to have that support to kind of step away and be able to process things that in a way that's closer to my intent. So uh, you also mentioned, uh, so we talked earlier, uh, the importance of universal design. Yeah. Right, and making technology more accessible, especially in a neurodiverse world for people on the spectrum. Can you talk a little bit about that? Okay, so universal design is sort of this principle that you can try to create technologies that meet the needs of a lot of different people, even if, um, like, even if it's something that's like not technically specific, but it meets a lot of people's needs. And for autistic folks, um, there are certain things that we benefit from, even if they're not specifically, even if it doesn't specifically say for autistic people. For example, um, for example, something like cart captioning was, I believe, originally created for people who are hard of hearing or deaf, who are not users of ASL or another or your other national sign language like BSL or Auslan, whatever. But um, captioning, um, a lot of um, there are a lot of autistic people out there who have sensory processing issues or auditory processing issues or maybe overloaded by the acoustics or something in a large conference room. But using, um, but using captioning is a way to help people kind of understand what's going on, even if the technology wasn't explicitly designed as an autism support. Um, similar phenomena exist with, say, Hmm. Or even something like typography or fonts you use on your computer. Um, there are some people who, there are some autistic people who may have issues processing or reading things because of the way things look on paper, because of sort of the stroke contrasts in the letters. But there are, like for example, there was this, um, there was a uh, font design company that actually created a um, typeface for their website that was designed for a British organization, MenCap, that um, advocates for and with people with intellectual disabilities or learning disabilities, as they say in the UK. Um, and while that typeface was originally designed for people with ID, it's also helpful for autistic people and dyslexic people and other people who may also have difficulties processing printed words. Like I, like you know, I don't have the disability it was originally designed for, but it but it's a form of universal design that makes things easier to read for me as well. So it's not, you know, while it was originally created for people with ID, it's also helpful for people with other disabilities or people who have ID and another disability. So thank you so much. You know, thinking about social inclusion, obviously, you know, assistive technologies is just a, a piece of that whole conversation, uh, but, you know, it intersects with broader social inclusion. So one example is, you know, we're talking about assistive technologies and the need to have access to access uh, um, assistive technologies, but at the same time, the device itself be can become a barrier. And I think as Chloe wonderfully shared earlier, she said some people will say, well, just don't use your device, just tell me. So there's that uncomfortableness with having a device or an object that you know people are not used to seeing in the, in, in the middle of a conversation, if you will. So that's something we have to overcome as well. I agree. Um, I think that advocating for access to AAC also involves kind of reshaping the way we see technology as an aid in people's lives, um, whether that's to do with disability or other, um, or other ways that people may feel marginalized, oppressed, or separated from others because of their experiences that may not match that of the majority of the society in which they live. And it's important for people to understand exactly how important, I mean, how exactly how beneficial it is to have technology that allows people to connect to others. And that could be um, assistive devices that people use to talk. It can be, um, it could be like 
visual schedules or other tools that people use, and we need to destigmatize de it. And I think that a lot of that stigma is deeply rooted. There's a lot of like there's a lot of deeply embedded ableism, not just in the United States, but around the world. Though I mean, its forms may take different shapes depending on the society in which those stereotypes arise. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. And fostering social inclusion through assistive technology necessarily re requires that we ask ourselves the tough questions about what it means to have a disability, what it means to be included in the community, and how we can work strenuously toward ensuring that that inclusion happens as opposed to consigning people to institutions or the sort of isolation where you're sort of possessed with, or virtual isolation, where you're basically possessed with impotent rage and frustration because people can't understand what you're saying because all you're left with is making noises or hand gestures, which are communication. However, if you are thinking things that other people can't hear because you can't, you don't have the motor planning skills or other, um, or you have another disability that prevents you from talking, that's a barrier. And, and we just need to uproot these stereotypes. We need to question the idea that having a disability makes you less valuable. We need to get rid of this idea that people's worth is predicated on their intelligence, that people's worth is predicated on their motor abilities or appearance or any other characteristic other than the content of their character to paraphrase Martin Luther King. Thank you. Probably. Thank you so much, Finn. So we're gonna uh, move on to Tom Island. Now, Tom Island, uh, I think, had a life-changing experience uh, that opened a door for him with an assistive technology. He's gonna share that story with us. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. First of all, let me say what an honor it is to be here today, and I actually have a, a bucket list of 101 things I wanna do <laughs> before I die, and talk at the United Nations was number 63, so you can check that right off. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so you mentioned that I Want, I am a CPA. Basically, I grew up as a boy being good with numbers and loving Star Wars, and I made it my goal in life to be George Lucas's accountant <laughs> and put that into motion. I went to school, and as I was going through school, I realized I had difficulty with reading, and this is very common in people with autism, reading comprehension and understanding the words on the page. They can sound it out, but do they know the meaning of the words? And when it came to taking the CPA exam, part of the CPA exam requires that I understand how to write a memo to a company or write a letter to a client. And the terms in the test were often very complex. I think uh, when I was in college, my mother, who is here today, met, saw that I did not know the meaning of the word conservative. And I could not ask the test proctor during the exam, what does this word mean? And so my mother, who's been my number one advocate and still in many ways still is, we got it. I'll thank you for the applause back there. <laughs> <laughs> we went to a board certified psychologist and had some tests done and basically the test showed that I had a vocabulary gap. And I submitted this information to the Board of Accountancy in California, that's where I'm from, and the Board of Accountancy complies with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And they reviewed the data and when you base your needs or your requests on data and facts, you can't go wrong. They basically responded, you're right, you do have a vocabulary gap, but we're not testing your ability to know words, we're testing your ability to apply the principles of accounting. So they said, and they thought of this, not me, not my mother, they said to me, we're gonna send you a Franklin Electronic Dictionary that you can use during the test to look up words that you don't know, and that can improve your performance. And who would have thought that that was even available until I made the ask. I wish I had had that Franklin Electronic Dictionary in college, in high school, in junior high school, and even elementary school, so I could look up words that I don't know. So I want to encourage all of you that are in the room today, whether you are a self-advocate, whether you're an ally, and my mother and I define an ally as someone who is a parent, a teacher, a therapist, or someone that helps 
someone with autism become their best selves, to use devices like a Franklin Electronic Dictionary or allow that kind of accommodation to be used during exams, tests, or other situations to improve the performance of young people with autism. It's not special treatment, it's not an unfair advantage, it's not cheating, it's helping our young people succeed. You're thank, too kind. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Tom. And I think we really need to give a shout out to the American to Dis with Disabilities Act mm -hmm. also, always. We, I don't think we've mentioned it enough today, but uh, it's so important in so many of our lives. So thank you for uh, mentioning hashtag go uh, ADA. <laughs> So another thing that's, that's so important to the lives, uh, you know, for independent living is uh, making sure that you're safe, uh, interacting from time to time with law enforcement, which can be tricky, and also uh, keeping yourself healthy and others healthy in emergency situations. And you also have an um, interesting story to share there also with your mom. So your mom's going to speak from her chair there, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit and then she can follow on. Certainly, I'll lead into it with another story. So I mentioned I am a CPA and uh, three and a half years ago, I actually left that line of work altogether because I realized just how miserable I was sitting at a desk all day. And I imagine not all CPAs are miserable, but this one was. <laughs> and I realized that this is where I belong. It's telling my story to world leaders like you and helping bring out the best in people with autism. So I left that career behind three and a half years ago, but well before I left that, and sh actually shortly after I was diagnosed at the age of 13 with autism, I was learning how to drive. And I have a number of Jim Carrey movies memorized, if some of you know who that comedian is. He's got Dumb and Dumber, Liar, Liar, and Not So Pleasant <laughs> Movies. And I have these movies memorized word for word and my mother and I had to make a little agreement that if I was going to drive, if I was going to have a license, I can't say anything to a police officer that Jim Carrey said in his movies. <laughs> and I've kept that promise. <laughs> but let's segue into the young people with autism in your life. When they come across an officer, a first responder, someone who's an emergency personnel, how do you think they're going to react in that situation? We think we put safety first, but the reality, ladies and gentlemen, is we are leaving safety to chance. And you may think that a caregiver or someone who knows your young person being there will solve all the problems. I'm here to tell you it's not going to solve all your problems. Because my mother and I have trained police officers for over 20 years. And as part of independent living, it's not just being confined to a household. It's about venturing and being part of your community. And you could be saying, Minding your own business, and this is a true story, be mistaken for an armed robber, and police safety will supersede your situation or your diagnosis. Their protocols kick in, and then they, if they think you're armed, they will not hesitate to come out with their guns drawn. You think our young people are ready for that? So we're quick to think. Train the police. It's all on them. Our young people don't know any better. Well, guess what? Our young people do know better, and we have the opportunity and the necessity to teach them, our young people, our people with autism, how to interact with the police. So that it comes full circle. Training the police is only half the equation. Young people with autism also need to know just as much how to interact with the police. And mind you, talking isn't teaching, it's video modeling, like watching movies, showing what to do that will allow the situation to stick with people with autism. Great, okay, now and I think it's over to mom, Emily Island. For my mic. <laughs> yep, you're good. Okay. So um, I made a film called Be Safe the Movie with Joey Travolta, starring individuals <clears throat> with disabilities interacting with real police officers to show them what to do because we need to think about receptive learning, not just expressive. You don't need to be able to speak to interact safely with the police, but you certainly need to be shown what to do, what's expected, so that you can cooperate. And I also created a curriculum that goes along with the movie filled with visual tools, vocabulary building, and other concepts that need to be taught explicitly. So that's what Be Safe is all about, Be Safe the movie. And it's low tech technology, it's video modeling, but we know video modeling works uh, for people across the spectrum of all ages, of all verbal abilities, and all cognitive abilities, and that's why it's such a powerful tool. Thank you. 
So was there a 911 example as well? I would say, getting back to the idea of a caregiver being with you, if let's say your caregiver is incapacitated or unconscious, does your young person or your person with autism have 911 or some way to text or communicate to first responders that help is needed? Sometimes we don't really think of these things until it's too late. So proactivity, foreseeing what if you weren't around, something happened to you unexpected, how would your person with autism communicate? They need help, you need help. These are forward thinking ideas. Thank you so much, Tom Island and Emily Island. Uh, mom, again, a shout out to the moms. Also the dads, but yeah. we've heard more of the moms today. I'm a dad too, but uh, thank you very much. So on to Sangeeta Jain. Uh, we're gonna, you're from northern India, and perhaps you can tell us what is the situation like there in terms of access to assistive technologies. We've heard about sort of the high tech and the low tech. I think you can put it in a nice perspective for us, the situation uh, where you're from. Yeah, I'm, uh, so before I speak about the assistive technology, I would say that in my country, we still are dealing with, you know, housing options and other severe issues. So I would just say that uh, as a parent, I'm also a parent of a 19 and a half year old son. So this is a common goal for everyone, the independent living, but it feels a long way off. So definitely in India, most of them use, uh, they, they live with their families and uh, because we really do not have too many options for the, you know, the group homes and other things. So, um, but I would just like to share that recently, I don't know this is probably such a nice thing I'm hearing about, but I definitely want to share that recently, one mother killed her two sons and she committed suicide. And there is a father who has a daughter with severe disability who's demanded a euthanasia. So this is the fact of life that people with the severe disabilities are isolated in their families and are they don't have any support. And we are talking about definitely about assistive technology, which, which would definitely enable them to lead independent lives. But that's, that's what the situation is. And secondly, I, I often believe that we're not preparing enough our children to live on their own. And this has to start very, very early, very early when they're very young. And most of the children, when they're young, they are going to the school programs in India, I can only speak from my, the perspective of my country, it's totally focused on the academics. So leave about the assistive technology, the general skills they're not even focused on. So, and parents also claw onto the idea of like, okay, this is the normal, see? So rather than teaching the, the essential skills which would build on the, you know, um, which would negotiate adult life, they are clinging onto that and we just lose out on some few years before we even realize that what, what we are doing. And uh, so the independent living, yes, definitely, I totally believe that we need to prepare so that as everyone is talking about the interdependent system, rather than portraying them as dependent on their families, let's work on the skills and assistive technology where we can make them cap capable and they are able to live in their families where it's a win-win situation and they can continue living in their community because right now adults, uh, we're also having a problem because the joint family system that we have in India and the sibling support is also shrinking at a very, very fast pace. So I think uh, this is all where we are and definitely the access to assistive technology, we, we are definitely, you know, we, it's, even if it's like, like um, we, we, I heard about the low-tech devices, it's not about that we need Prologo to go and so on. So even if we're talking about the communication with pictures, we're talking about the visual shadows, we know that it helps immensely for the community participation and, and to live independently. However, we still need that training to that hand-holding, you know, for... So I'm uh, very fortunate that we have collaborated with Global Autism, the place where I work. So, but most of the centers, I, I think they lack training. So living independently needs to start very early and young with small steps. And that's where we lack. And giving families and individuals hope that they have yes. that to look forward to. Yes, thank, you. thank you so much. So I'm thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Sangeeta Jain, for bringing that perspective. 
Uh, I just want to flag to the technician, I want to queue up the next video that's coming and introduce Judy Mark um, from the UCLA Disability Study Department and also with Disability Voices United. So if we can start with the video and then we'll go to you, does that sound okay? Um, what else did I say was going to happen on the 28th? You guys remember? Lunch. We were lunch. Yes, we're serving lunch. That's a good one. We're also going to have you feel what it's like to have to type to communicate and be non-speaking. So you're the first 30 minutes of your meeting with the community teachers, you're not allowed to speak. You're not even allowed to just do things like, oh, I messed up or just none of that. It's non-speaking. And then what we're also going to do is to make it hard for you to motor through your typing. So guess what? You're going to be wearing a ski glove. Okay, you can only use one finger. You're not using all 10 fingers to type. Being in my own thoughts was really complicated when I heard all these other noises around me and how I can't even listen to music when I study just because like that's already distracting with itself. So just hearing all these noises that you actually don't want to hear and trying to formulate your own thoughts was really difficult. This was your idea, man. <laughs> how did you feel? How did you feel about them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I can. Mm -hmm. oh, not E. Trying to sing the I R E L. Not entirely. <laughs> That's what we can do in a limited sense. D I F F E E N E E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N E N Dylan, thank you so much. And I think that's some, that's very bold and important for our filmmakers that it's not only about inclusion, but really not ignoring the differences. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that video with us. Uh, you focused so much of your advocacy work on uh, self-determination, which of course is, is a, a critical component uh, that's mentioned in the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, including the right to legal self-determination uh, as a prerequisite for living independently. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of assistive technologies are there that can support people to exercise this right of self-determination that so many people have talked about? Absolutely. So this panel um, is about independent living skills. And one of the concerns that I have is the sort of obsessive focus that so many of our schools and our service providers have on independent living skills. So they want to teach folks with autism how to ride the bus, how to call it mobility training, how to cook, um, how to do their laundry. Um, and what they don't focus enough on is self-advocacy skills and self-determination. Because what is the true point of independence if you can't make your own choices and have, and have control of your life? Um, you know, true independence really is about self-determination and self-advocacy. In California, we were able to get a law passed that allows people with developmental disabilities, including autism, to be able to have self-determination and have complete choice and control over how they're supported in their lives. It's, it, I have to tell you that even though we got this law passed over five years ago, five and a half years ago, it has been um, a fight just to get it implemented because the institutions that exist to support people with autism and other developmental disabilities are having a hard time letting go. 
because they have PhDs in whatever, uh, in psychology or whatever field they're in, and they don't understand that we have PhDs in ourselves or PhDs in our children, and that we can make our own choices. Um, so, you know, interdependence, I don't generally use the term independence, but interdependence is not easy. Um, and many people with autism, I'm a parent as well, and my son is gonna require support his entire life. Um, but that doesn't mean he shouldn't be able to have choice and control over his, his life. Uh, it also means that um, we shouldn't move as parents quickly to a to mode of a guardianship or conservatorship. That we should be looking at supported decision making. And that we should be giving the tools to allow people to make their own choices and to support their choices from the earliest ages. And that will help them become more interdependent as they get older. The problem is we're not moving towards interdependence. We're moving, we either are dependent or we're trying to focus completely on independence. Uh, the other concern that, that I've seen is that, you know, assistive technology is really critical. There's no way that we can know what people like DJ, like Neil, um, want and uh, desire in their lives without assistive, assistive technology. But all the assistive technology in the world will not require that people presume competence in people with autism. And all the Assistance, assistive technology in the world will not guarantee that people with autism's choices are respected. And so with that assistive technology has to come this education of the general community and that there has to be this presumption that people's communication are, is real. And that, um, and that the, the other thing that we haven't really focused on as much here is that assistive technology is, is not equal uh, throughout our, our communities, here in the United States and around the world, and that there are racial and ethnic disparities that we see in, in the provision of services and the provision of the ability for people to access um, assistive technology and be able to make choices on their own. And so, you know, I think that there's still, you know, we, we have some great technology and it's actually outpaced our ability to use it and our ability to believe in it. And so I think that, we, that our communities and our civic society has a lot of catching up to do. So thank you for, so much. You know, this day is such a day of hope. And, and so many of the examples are frustrating. But uh, really, I think what we're talking about and what we're sharing with each other is a world of possibilities. And you know, uh, we've heard stories of, you know, if it were not for this opportunity, I would not be here today, for example. And I think that's where uh, you know it's constructively the best thing to do to focus our energies and our thoughts. You know, how can we uh, focus on the opportunities and and increase the number of opportunities available? So I just wanted to start with Sangeeta, come back across. We've heard each other's stories and talking, and just some more thoughts about okay, where in, in do I see more opportunities for providing? Uh, access to assistive technologies to kids and uh, adults in, on the spectrum in my uh, environment. Yeah, this mic. You need to press your button. Okay. Oh, there you go, you're okay. You're on. Okay. So uh, definitely, like most of us, for the children who have severe disability and probably that what, uh, what I've been talk, uh, listening about, non-speaking, they need to be, you know, uh, for the communication, that needs to be worked on. So in India, definitely, or probably I see a lot of work uh, being done on receptive language, but somewhere the expressive part is missed out. So maybe believing in that, uh, maybe they don't speak yes. and they don't have uh, to say anything, and most of the self-advocates have talked about it. So uh, if we build on the communication, that would be really encouraging for every adult on spectrum or every child on spectrum, and we'll be probably able to make up so many other uh, ways. So, and the other thing that we I want to talk about, even if it is the communication or it is about the, you know, the organization skills like visual schedules, and we all know that our people on the spectrum have these uh, challenges organizing themselves and uh, for the interpersonal skills, and which provides the predictability. These visual schedules, and these are probably very low-tech devices, which can be, which can go to different countries, and probably we don't need to invest so much. 
However, uh, here also there is a challenge that maybe we believe that initially this person needs to be told about the scenario and then later on the person gets used to it, the routine and so whatsoever. So for a limited initial period, it, it is required, then, then probably a person can behave normally and this is a normal routine. So I mean, would we ever do this to a person with visual impairment and say like, oh, you've used the cane enough and now you know the community ways and you can walk independently. So why is it for our, our children? It is not making the way to the mainstreams and the workplaces, even if it is introduced initially, then it's not taking, and everyone believes like, okay, you got to, you know it now, and by this you know it. So somewhere developing on these small, small things to start with, and in my country, I think it would be a great idea. And this is what I truly believe, that to be understood and to understand the world. And somewhere we need to work on assistive technology, maybe not very high tech, because if it comes from the West, because we really do not have that kind of research. So if it comes, it would have its culture barriers. For instance, I was trying to teach my son um, asking for a biscuit. So, and I could almost never figure it out, because you guys call it a cookie. <laughs> so for, for, you know, they're, they're going to be terminology barriers. I can't say that, okay, send me some softwares for the expressive till the time I don't have something in India. But definitely some part of it with the low-tech devices, which definitely are of great help, can be uh, introduced. But then again, we need a training to build up stepwise, just not introduce it, because most of the professionals, I believe, they lack training in this. Thank you. Your training is a very important one. So yes. uh, we don't want to uh, get off time. So uh, just final thoughts I, I be short and sweet. Uh, down, the, down the panel. Thank you. Well, I saved the best for last as I sure. close here. So something that has helped me over the years, and mind you, I'm where I am today because of years of therapy, mentoring, coaching, training, and instruction. But I understand that it is my future that is at stake, and I'm working towards a better future for myself. and a better future for people with autism. And one of my biggest secrets to success, four years ago I joined Toastmasters International. That helped me manage my mm. fear of public speaking and I just recently applied to become a Toastmasters accredited speaker. There are only 81 of them in the world and none of them have autism. Thank you. <laughs> for those that have mastered public speaking and apply it to their trade. I'm also competing in the Toastmasters International World Championship of Public Speaking. And I plan to close my contest speech with the following. Find your voice and use it. Solidify your message to the world and own it. My message to the world, I'll share it with you today. It's a mantra. Know yourself. Love yourself. Be yourself. I thought of that myself, thank you. And this is, coming, this is coming from a man that does video talk and quoting movies, now I thought of that on my own. And finally, tell your story and live it. Because life isn't going to come to you, it's up to you to come to life. Life is just too short to sit back and wait for the world to change for you. As Gandhi said, you must be the change you want to see in the world today. Whether you are a self-advocate, an ally, a policymaker, or a decision maker, you have the power to come to life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Finn, over to you for a quick final talk. OK. So as several others have said as well, um, Supporting assistive technology is not just about the technology itself, it's about the principle of including people with disabilities in public life precisely because we are people and because we deserve to be integrated with the others around us, not isolated um, in sheltered workshops or other environments that deprive us of the right to um, have choices over our lives. Um, furthermore, we should understand um, community inclusion as something that intersects with other experiences of marginalization or 
oppression or difference. Um, for example, we need to take into account both race and disability in tandem. For example, um, at least in the US, um, people, there are racial disparities in how the police handle disability. Even though people with disabilities are in general more likely to be targeted by the police, there are still racial differences if you're African American or Latino or um, otherwise black or brown, then you are probably at a higher risk of being um, attacked or murdered or imprisoned. And I think it's important when we're talking about dealing with com community involvement and law enforcement, we need to take into account issues like race. And that's not just, and of course, these issues about community inclusion and intersectionality are not just about race, they're about gender, they're about sexuality, sexual orientation, gender identity, immigration status, culture, et cetera. Um, and, you know, Sangeeta kind of touched on that a little earlier about technology that matches a person's culture. Um, you see a lot of these technologies out there that presume that everybody using it is American, like all the spellings are American, the like terminology is American, like the places it refers to are American. That won't work if you're using it in India or Nigeria, the UK, or any of these other places. There's like, it would only work in the United States. Like there are certain things that are, you know, and user interfaces are not, are supposed to reflect the user's culture, not necessarily the programmers. Um, you kind of have to think of user interfaces as being an aspect of someone's home and it should match the culture of the user. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you. Very, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Finn. And on to Judy. And I think you wanted to introduce a colleague yeah, to maybe... Yes. I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the film that you saw. <clears throat> so, um, the, so the film that you saw uh, is based on um, a class that I co-teach with Stuart Ostrick, who, if, Stuart, if you want to come up or if you just want to wave, whatever you would like to do, um, as well as Jinku Kwan, who is up there filming. It is called the UCLA Autism Media Lab, and it is a really incredible seminar that we are teaching um, this entire school year where we are um, creating a documentary, short documentary films about the inclusion of people with autism who are non-speaking or minimally speaking in various settings such as healthcare and education and employment. And in fact, um, one of the great things about our class is that we are co-teaching this class with people with autism who are non-speaking. Neil Katz is one of our teachers in our class. And each of our community teachers are part of the film crew that is gonna go out and make one of these documentary films. Um, so what you were seeing there was some students um, in the UCLA class working with their community teachers in having them have that experience of what it's like to be able to have a delay in communicating and, and having to type to communicate. Um, the, the interesting thing about our class is that you know, while we are making these films about inclusion, we are having to practice inclusion to create the films. And the theme that we have realized throughout this endeavor is that inclusion is really hard. Um, many of you probably know that inclusion is really hard, but that because it is hard doesn't mean that you should stop trying to reach that goal. Uh, and um, one of the things is that we don't want, our films that we're making are not going to be, look at this is what inclusion looks like and it's really awesome and you can do it too. Because it's, it's actually really hard and we want to acknowledge the difficulty and that everybody has to be bought in, in including people who are non-speaking and believing in them to be able to be contributing members of, of these communities. So I don't, um, so, so. So maybe a, a quick word from, do, from the, the microphone there if you need to, because we yeah, need to move he's on. Good. He's good. Okay. Yeah. So, so thank you all for, for letting us show the film. And next year, we would love, if possible, to come back and show you the actual work of the, um, of the students with their community teachers and how they created these films. And, and actually, that piece that you saw is part of a making of documentary. So we're actually um, creating kind of behind the scenes film about how we created this inclusive uh, pr uh, project at UCLA. All right, thank you so much. Help me uh, uh, thank the panelists one more time. So we've got Finn Gardner, Tom Island, Sangeeta Jain, and Judy Mark. Thank you so, so much thank for you. joining us. So honored to be here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to uh, invite our, our last group of panelists up with us, and then we have a special speaker to wrap up today's event. 
from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. That will be uh, the end of our event in a couple of minutes. But we have one more group, and I'd like to introduce them now. We're going to focus on uh, some tools, tools for well-being, tools for learning, and sharing learning across borders and globally. And that's another big uh, opportunity area. And as we're focusing on opportunities, it's, I think, a wonderful way uh, to wrap up. And because we're at the United Nations, uh, global learning is a particularly uh, apropos theme, I think. So please join us. Your, your, uh, your names will come up soon. Here they come. Fantastic. And I'll, uh, in the meantime, I'll start. Here we go. I'll start uh, with the introductions. To my left, we will have, she's making our way up to the dais, Rachel Barcelona, who is a writer, singer, and former Miss Teen Florida International. She's also a board member of the University of South Florida Center for Autism. Please join us on the dais. We have Molly Olapini, who's the founder and CEO of the Global Autism Project. She established the organization with the purpose of training local professionals after witnessing the lack of support available for people with autism in Ghana in the early 2000s. And the organization now works in 10 different countries across four continents. With her, we have Archie Brechin, who is a self-advocate and outreach associate at the Global Autism Project. And he's based here in New York, in Brooklyn. Brooklyn in the house. <laughs> And we also have, <laughs> we also have Pooja Panasar, who's a founder of the Kaizora Center for Neurodevelopmental Therapies in Kenya and the first board certified behavioral analyst in East Africa, East Africa's first BCBA, that's historic, right? She's going to get a statue someday. <clears throat> And finally, we have Vaisal Sahin, who's a president of the Autism Federation of Turkey based in Istanbul. So thank you all for being with us. And we're going to start with uh, Rachel. So Miss Teen Florida um, must have been an incredible experience. And uh, so tell us how the pageant world uh, changed your life. OK, well, I'm 22 now, so I'm no, no longer a teen. Woo! <laughs> OK. OK, so the pageant world definitely changed my life as an individual with autism because I started them when I was five years old, believe it or not. And you know that boys are more diagnosed than <laughs> girls with autism. And I experienced going to social groups and being the only girl. And that made me feel really isolated. Even though I made a lot of friends who were boys, I just, I wanted a friend who was a girl that I could talk about girl things with. Mm. So my mom, who's out there, Hi, Mom. <laughs> she put me in pageants and modeling, and I still do that today, and it helped me come out of my shell. Thank you so much. You also play um, uh, an important role and bring your experiences to the board at the University of South uh, Florida Center for Autism. Can you tell us, especially the links to assistive technologies that we're talking about today, tell us about your role there. Yes, I've been on the board for the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities for over a decade now, and that has helped me come out of my shell as well. We raise a lot of money for assistive technology and for families who may not be able to afford the technologies for their kids, and that's something that I'm very proud of because there's so many individuals on the spectrum who need stuff like that, and that's just been my pride and joy. So um, another thing you've talked about is, so we talked about high-tech assistive technologies. We talked about low-tech assistive, te te assistive technologies. <laughs> and there's also no-tech assistive technologies, such as a support animal, which I believe you use, right? Yes, OK. So I have a service dog named Harvest. And I use him because I have epilepsy as well. I have my medical bracelet right here. And I also have balance issues, too, because there's several comorbid things that can go along with autism. And when I'm not walking in heels, I'm walking with Harvest, and he, he, he just helps me so much. I love him to death. So as a, you know, I think most of us, uh, if not all of us in this room, are on and actively using social media, but as a younger person, uh, perhaps you're using it a little bit more. 
Do you think it's an overstep to say that social media also for the autism community is in itself also an assistive technology? I very much think that it's a, a great assistive technology to people with autism and neurotypicals as well. I use it, I'm on pretty much everything, but I think everyone knows that when you're on social media, you can say anything behind a screen. It gives you a certain sort of confidence that you don't have in the real world. And when I post things on social media, it gives me the confidence to say, hey, this is me, I have autism, look at what I'm capable of. And I think anyone, no matter where you are on the spectrum, can do that as well. Yay! Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much for being with, uh, with us here from Tampa, Florida. We really appreciate it that you and your mom came up here uh, to be with us and for you to share your experiences. We're going to move on now to Molly Olapini, who's the founder and CEO of the Global Autism Project. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your origin story sure. and the link to assistive technologies and uh, your... Uh, linkages to the first BCBA in East Africa. <laughs> My linkages. Um, yeah. So the Global Autism Project started in 2003 when I moved to Ghana with a child with <clears throat> autism as his ABA therapist. And the plan was that I would stay for a few months to a year and support him. And what ended up happening is people started um, coming literally to the home where I was living, the school where I was working, looking for the woman who knew what autism was. So I was 23, I sort of knew what autism was. I hadn't finished my undergrad. Um, I'd taken this short-term gig um, that has turned into, that was 15 years ago now, so has turned into a 15-year career um, of running the Global Autism Project. And the Global Autism Project partners with people. You've met many of our amazing partners today. Um, and I just want to shout out quietly to the Global Autism Project people who are here. Hi, all. Uh, <laughs> Jeff said I could do that. Um, we partner with countries all over the world that are looking to support people with autism. Um, we specifically train in evidence-based, um, meaning things that have had research that have proven their efficacy. Um, that's been a really important piece to us. We're very concerned, of course, about some of the pseudoscientific and even dangerous things that happen around the world. Um, in terms of assistive technology, as Sangeeta mentioned in India and others um, have mentioned as well, we're we're not entirely there yet. Um, you know, where we are in a lot of countries around the world is that basic human rights are being violated, that children with autism are being kept in cages, people with autism are being um, locked in rooms, and so that's, that's the urgency to this work. That's why we're so fortunate to have the partners that we have around the world doing this work. Um, as far as my connection to, to Pooja, part of our model is that people have to reach out to us um, you know, we say, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, teach a man a fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. And we say, why don't we ask if they're hungry? Um, and so by doing that, we're able to look at, um, we're able to know that we're working in places where what we're doing is wanted and needed. And so Pooja and her center reached out to us um, years ago now, and we began, we, we were looking at the panel and we said, I guess we were doing telemedicine. Back then we called it Skype. Um, but that is, that is how we did the training, um, the initial training, and Pooja will talk more about it. But our model today includes distance training um, or telemedicine as well as on-the-ground training. Um, and everything that we're doing is rooted in cultural relevance and sustainability. Thank you so much. So Pooja, over to, over to you. How did you uh, become the first uh, BCBA? And tell us about you know, the challenge in front of you and also the, the opportunities that you see. Thank you so much for having us all here today. Um, so it's, it's been quite a journey. Um, I'm born and raised in Kenya, but I have my undergrad education from Canada. When I went back to Kenya after that, I had one parent who saw my CV as I was applying for jobs anywhere. Um, and they saw that I'd worked with a person with autism before because that's what I got into when I was in my undergrad in Canada. So that parent brought in the first table in the two chairs, said, please work with my child. Um, did so much, the child came so far, we managed 
going quite far, word of mouth, another trial came, another one, another one, so on until I was like, okay, I need to make this official. I need to register something and you know get it going, and that's how Kaizora was born. Um, at the same time, I was like, I was connecting with a lot of my professors and everyone back in Canada, but it's not enough. I wanted to make sure what I'm doing is legit, how I'm helping the children is valid and I'm seeing progress and am I doing the best that I can do. So in that pursuit, I got a scholarship um, with the University of Massachusetts in Boston, connected with Molly as well and started getting some support from her too. At that time, the Global Autism Project was Molly and Kaizora was Puja. <laughs> and we used to talk directly and you know, it's, it's amazing how far everything has come. So that's where it kind of um, started from. And through the scholarship, I got my courses. Through the Global Autism Project, I got my supervision. And it was quite a process to become the first BCBA, but I'm very proud of how far we have come and how much we've been able to bring for, for the individuals with autism in Kenya. I have. Um, yeah. So if if you can, so I, it, it seems like you must have a, a mountain of challenges in front of you. So talk about what do you think is you know perhaps the top one or two challenges, but also the big opportunity that you see. Maybe just a couple a couple of uh, examples of that. So relating it to the assistive technology as well, tying it all in with what we do at the center. Um, I'm really excited that we have students who are using low tech. We have a lot of picture communication. We have a student who is non-speaking, but he is so smart. He can spell everything out. He's doing comprehension, little boy. Um, and we have a few who are also using iPads and Proloquo and LAMP. LAMP is one that I'm actually really excited about because it um, involves a lot of the motor processing. Um, however, the difficulties that we do end up facing, like what we kind of need to get past, is iPads are expensive. <laughs> Most of these apps are available on iPads and not on Android. So, you know, those are some of the things that hopefully um, won't be much of a challenge in the future and everyone can have access. Yes, and another universal universality issue for access to um, these technologies and these tools. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So let's um, also then hear from uh, Archibald. So tell us about your role, uh, bringing it back to Brooklyn and the United okay. States uh, with the organization. All right, excellent, um, perfect. So um, first of all, I would like to uh, make a statement of gratitude towards everybody in the room here today for um, supporting all of us. This is a wonderful cause and I'm really glad to have such a um, wide and enthusiastic delegation. I would also like to thank my family for continuing to support me in my endeavors and to, you know, for just really opening up the possibilities for me. Um, it's actually my mom's birthday today, so I just want to wish her <laughs> happy birthday before beginning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And so um, my role with the Global Autism Project is actually an outreach associate. So what I do is essentially I travel around the country and hopefully eventually the world to different events and I speak in general about the organization and the work that we do and uh, what our model is and just sort of, you know, act as sort of, you know, one of the organization's ambassadors, you know, just on a, you know, kind of a public relations level. Um, I'm also, you know, in my own independent role, I'm a self-advocate and um, proud language enthusiast and um, aspiring uh, translator, interpreter, and language teacher. Um, and I'm also very passionate about um, people on the spectrum using their special interests and talents to um, make careers and to really um, contribute to society to the level and extent that they wish to in the way that, you know, is most comfortable for them. And my overall dream is that every individual on the spectrum has access to the supports and services necessary to enhance their quality of life and live full, rich, and meaningful lives, not in spite of their uh, disability or label, but actually because of it. Thank you so much, Archie. Now we're going to move on to our speaker from uh, Turkey, from Istanbul, the president of the Autism Federation of Turkey, Vesel Sahin. I believe you have a... Uh, you've prepared uh, a statement to read, and then yeah. perhaps we'll have a, a quick chat. Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel extremely honored to be here amongst all of you and to have been given the chance to share my experience as the president of Autism Federation in Turkey. Uh, my main goal was over the course of six years that I served as a federation was 
to raise the necessary amount of awareness about autism spectrum disorder in Turkey. Go gather, like, to gather all existing nonprofit organizations under one roof. I can proudly say that my team and I we managed to achieve the goals. Although in retrospect, I can also easily admit that it has been a long and challenging road. We have made tremendous amount of progress over the years and have been first took on this role. There was limited understanding amongst the public about disabilities. The extent of the lack of awareness in the Turkish society was devastating. Majority of our community were not educated and therefore lacked of basic knowledge on children with disabilities, particularly children with who would be considered to be on autism spectrum. Today, as a society, we have notably improved on this issue of awareness. However, however, globally, cases of autism are increasing exponentially. Right now, we have <coughs> CD records in one of 69 children who are diagnosed with ASD in the 15 to 20 years. If this individual cannot access to proper education, we will be faced with the detrimental problem. Therefore, this is a no longer concern of single country or city, but the entire world. I believe that we have established the su su sufficient groundwork in Turkey and now it's time to think globally. In 1980s, in the global community under the leadership of United Nations showed unprecedented solidarity to battle AIDS at that time. Official number of the diagnosed with AIDS was tens of thousands of people. The urgency of inter intervening through public campaign. The, the United Nations recognized the urgency and intervened through public campaign and international uh, advertising. Today also, AIDS continue to be epidemic. Such campaigns were held due to United Nations immense success to rise in public awareness. We must truly recognize the successful outcome of early intervention and apply similar efforts to rise awareness in regards of what's in the global community I, the, in the past. In the past decades, we have made great progress in early diagnosis, which explained the prevalence of, prevalence of ASD in young children. Efforts to implement early intervention straight have yielded great results, but it's the, also important to think about how to serve them when they reach retirement age. In 15 to 20 years, all those children we have right now is going to be in retirement age, is going to create tremendous problem for not for the country, for the entire world. We must truly recognize the six, excuse me. I strongly believe that the delegation needs to be formed within the United Nations specifically to address the needs of people on autism spectrum on global level. This delegation can negotiate international budgets and donations for academic works, strengthen special education as a field and better educate the professionals, help countries in need to develop solution-oriented school modules and systems, help build medical laboratories and research units and better understand ASD, help increase community awareness and family education. I heavily called audience audience auction, action Let's show our unwavering support for this delegation to be formed as a collective. The United Nations is cap capable of creating immediate public movements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to wrap up this panel with a video message from Mr. Marok Sedgwick, an educator and consultant for special education, a non-speaking autistic self-advocate and creative producer of experimental documentary media, Fearless Minds Theatrical, who couldn't be here with us but has uh, shared this video with us. <clears throat> schools in California, USA. One day, a classroom teacher yelled at a student, I can't hear you. 
The teacher said this student needed to improve his speech. The student immediately turned and looked at me. I softly shook my head no. The teacher was both factually incorrect and violating this student's rights. When I lost my ability to speak, an ignorant doctor said, if you don't start speaking, you won't be able to connect with human beings. I was angry because she implied my fellow non-speaking people, the students I love most, were not human. Since then, I have flourished in ways I never could when I had to speak to communicate. Speech is unnecessary. I was recently accepted for doctorate study at the Learning Sciences Research Institute at University of Illinois Chicago, to begin this fall. In the Learning Sciences, we study how we learn and how culture affects learning. I will produce curricula and educational media to teach non-speaking students multiliteracies, from reading and writing to interacting with digital media and beyond. The learning sciences also show that youth need a positive sense of self. Telling a student who struggles to speak that speech is best is telling him something is inherently wrong with him. It denies him his right to become his most true self for phonocentric reasons that become ever more arbitrary as AAC gets better and cheaper. I work with the students most educators don't want to, who have been kicked out of less restrictive environments. I see beautiful young people full of light and potential who all communicate vibrantly and passionately, and who are usually blocked from doing so in the ways best suited to them. It is our duty as the adults raising these kids to give them the tools they need to participate fully in our communities without speech. This goes beyond providing them with AAC, but to also provide them with curricula and educational media that feature people like them, and that teach them in ways consistent with their neurological and cultural needs. So Marek Sedgwick, I hope that you're watching. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. We're gonna wrap up this panel, and so I would like to thank uh, everyone for joining and give them the opportunity. I know that you've been taking quick notes. We have literally like a minute and a half before we invite our closing speaker. So if you can just make one final point. We've talked about the importance of awareness raising. You know, we, we've learned uh, how life-changing uh, assistive technologies can be, and we know, and we've learned, and we've hopefully uh, educated a lot of people that people have the right to these technologies to enjoy their basic human rights. So we've got awareness raising, and we need uh, policy, legislation, and resources uh, uh, that, are, that are still missing. So uh, just a, a quick final thought, really do just one thought in 30 seconds or less, and we're gonna start maybe with, I don't wanna put you on the spot, we'll just go across from Pooja uh, across to the end and then wrap up and enjoy, uh, invite our final speaker. Pooja, over to you. Oh, <laughs> um, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, it's, it's amazing to be here and learn so much from everyone, all the self-advocates today. Um, it's been very inspiring. I'm going back extremely motivated and I'm excited to see what changes we can make when we go back home as well. Um, I am also very motivated to, we're already using a lot of assistive technology, but we want to make it happen more. We want to ensure every person on the spectrum in Kenya gets a voice is able to express themselves, you know, and then we, we can say we've made a change. Okay, well, I think that assistive technology can very much help anyone with autism, but I think there's way too much focus on independence. People need to know that independence is not a race and that assistive technology can very much help with that. We need to cherish the time that we have with our autistic kids because that moment can pass away before our eyes. <laughs> Please. All right. um, well, I would just like to um, help conclude the panel by saying, you know, it was an honor being here in front of everybody. I've learned so much today, and yes, I definitely agree that assistive technology is the way of the future, and it's definitely, you know, every 
um, individual on the autism spectrum, regardless of where they live or how involved they may be on the spectrum, really deserves a, cha a chance to communicate in a way that makes them feel comfortable and happy and to have their voices be heard. Um, and for that, like, you know, I really, I was, you know, grateful of all this assistive technology that I myself was able to use. And I just, my one wish for the future is that that just, um, access to such technology just increases a uh, hundredfold. Um, I think in closing, I would just like to thank the UN, obviously, um, and just speak to the importance of making sure that we're bringing all voices to the table. I've been doing this work now for 15 years, and we absolutely, as, as practitioners, as parents, as, as anyone um, who cares to advance the rights of people with autism, please listen to the autistic community. Please do with and not for. Our association called Toho Motun Foundation estimates in Turkey there are uh, 434,000 kids age of 1 to 19 and 1 million 400,000 kids uh, people affected by autism, uh, the diagnosed autism in Turkey. Uh, if you don't work together, if you don't work with government, non government, low, te low technology, assistive technology, no technology, we have to get together, all, all countries. This is not just a matter of one country or one city or one state. This is not just the matter of United States or Europe. This is the whole world issues. And we have to get together, NGOs and governments together, work together. We have to solve this issue before it gets too late. Because all these kids we see right now, they will have their retirement age. It will create a chaos. As I know right now in Turkey, if two autistic kids goes into hospital for, for any reason, that hospital will have chaos. They wouldn't know what to do with it. They wouldn't know how to cope with it. That's why we have to get together, NGOs or government, we have to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll invite the speakers now to take a seat in the audience and invite our final speaker to make closing remarks. I'd, I'd really like to say that we are thrilled, we're honored, we're grateful that she's taking the time to be with us here today. And it's an honor and privilege to introduce Ms. Maria Francesca Spatolisano, who's the Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination at the United Nations, and she will speak from the lectern. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as it has been highlighted at this commemoration of World Autism Awareness Day, assistive technology provides an unprecedented opportunity to advance the rights and inclusion of persons with autism. On behalf of DESA, co-organizer of the World Autism Awareness Day, I express my gratitude for the excellent contributions of all participants in today's 2030 Agenda. According to the strategy, the design and use of new technology Our boy, uh, the world lighting up blue today, and not only is it World Autism Awareness Day, it's World Autism Awareness Month, so let's keep the conversation going. And in particular, I want to thank the self-advocates who have the courage and the strength to make sure we all keep our feet on the ground and we keep the conversation going in the right direction. Thank you. <laughs>